This video is sponsored by Brilliant. I don't really talk about myself on this channel much, and there's a good reason for that, and that's because I'm boring. But there's a part of me that seems to consistently catch people's attention, that I study biostatistics. And every time I say I study biostatistics, the response is always the same thing. What the hell is even that? According to one comment I got, it's straight up masochism. And that would be partially right. My go-to response is something like this. Biostatistics is helping clinical trials succeed so that more drugs can make it to more people. Of course, there's so much more to biostatistics than that, but it's pretty close to what I do, so that's what I say. When I was in Portland for JSM, I actually met someone who didn't know what a clinical trial was, so I just told him I helped make drugs. He stopped talking to me after that. But that conversation got me thinking. Clinical trials are one of the most important tools that humans have for saving lives. If you're like me and you take medicine every day just to live a regular life, then you benefit from a clinical trial. They're important and more people should be familiar with them. So in this video, I wanted to give you a deeper peek into what clinical trials are and the role that statisticians play in them. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal a channel for making you better at statistics. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm a student who studies biostatistics, and I make videos on various topics in the field. What even is a clinical trial in the first place? A clinical trial is a type of clinical research that tests and evaluates an intervention for the treatment or prevention of disease. This intervention could be something like a new drug, a surgery, or something behavioral. For this video, I'll talk as if the intervention was a drug, because that's what I'm most familiar with. By nature, clinical trials are experiments. This means that we control some independent variable, such as whether or not someone receives a treatment, to see how it affects some outcome of interest. This control makes clinical trials different from another type of clinical research, observational studies, where we can't control the independent variable. We simply observe data and look for significant associations in the data. For example, an observational study might find that taking Zin is associated with higher rates of mouth disease, but it can't say that this association is the same as a cause and effect relationship. Only a well-executed clinical trial can do that. Some of you may have noticed that I didn't mention statistics at all when defining a clinical trial. Clinical trials are just experiments, so why do statisticians matter there? The answer is data. All experiments produce data, and you need good statistics to make the best use out of this data. Not just in the analysis of the data, but in planning how we gather it in the first place. If a clinical trial is poorly planned, then no amount of fancy analysis is going to convince the FDA that your drug is safe to consume. In fact, the planning of experiments is so important that it constitutes its own subfield of statistics called experimental design, or clinical trial design, depending on who you ask. A famous statistician once said, To call in the statistician after the experiment is done, Maybe no more than asking him to perform a post-mortem examination. He only may be able to say what the experiment died of. In other words, you call the statistician first, not last. I've been saying clinical trial as if it's some singular concept, but there are actually many different types of clinical trials. Different clinical trials are designed to answer different questions that we might have about a new medicine. Stuff like, how much drug is safe to give to people? Does it work? Are there specific subgroups that the drug will work better in? And is it better than the stuff we currently have? That last one is literally the million dollar question. Pharma companies spend millions of dollars to try to get a yes answer to it. But they can't even begin to ask that question until they answer a bunch of other questions before. This series of questions and the clinical trials that come with them form what's called the traditional model of clinical trials. And it's actually the topic of this video. The traditional model consists of three phases of trials. This is literally the journey that all drugs must take in order to be approved for human use. The last question is actually answered in the very last phase, phase three. To help you through the journey of a drug, we'll use a hypothetical drug as an example. We'll call it We Normal, a cure for being statistically ignorant. Scientists at Very Normal Pharmaceuticals, not a real company by the way, developed this compound, and we think it could make the world a better place. The first thing we need to figure out for We Normal is how much to give to people. It's a totally new drug, so I'm not sure what a safe amount is for people to take. Answering these questions is the realm of what's called Phase 1 trials. Phase 1 trials are pretty small. They only recruit a few dozen people, and they're usually healthy or paid volunteers. But they could also be people who are extremely ill, and all other standard options have failed them. 
The point of a phase 1 trial isn't to figure out if we normal is effective or not, it's to figure out a safe dose for human consumption. The trials we use to figure this out are named dose finding studies. So how do they work? We have to talk about the fine line between therapy and toxicity. In very rough terms, the higher the dose, the more powerful the effect the drug will have on the body. You're more likely to benefit from a higher dose, but at the same time, you're more likely to experience a toxic side effect as well. I say toxic here, but that could mean any bad thing that can happen as a result of the drug, minor or severe. We think of this toxicity as a random event, with some probability of happening. As the dose increases, the probability of a toxicity will also increase monotonically. We call this the dose toxicity curve. To figure out a safe dose, we define some maximum probability that we tolerate for a toxicity. If a dose only causes toxicities at this rate, then we'd consider it safe enough to move forward with. This dose has a special name too, the maximum tolerated dose, or MTD. But that's easier said than done. We don't actually know what the dose toxicity curve looks like. We need a plan to gather data to figure that out. Usually, a clinical team will figure out a set of doses to try, and it's the job of the statistician to figure out how to assign people to different doses to best figure out the MTD. One approach is to just start at the lowest dose, give it to three people, and see if any of them get sick. If no one does, you move on to the next dose and give it to three more people. But if someone gets sick, you try it again at the same dose and move up if only one person in total gets sick. But if two or more people get sick at a given dose level, then you declare the dose below it the MTD. This is the so-called 3 plus 3 design. One advantage of this design is its simplicity. Anybody taught the design can run it. The problem with it is that it's too simple. It has a tendency to produce really crude MTD estimates. Other phase 1 designs try to model the dose toxicity curve with a known parametric function. The value of the parameter for this function will change the shape of the curve, and you can update it according to incoming data. This is a model-based design as opposed to the rule-based design in 3 plus 3. Using this model, you can choose the dose that's closest to your desired toxicity rate. After you observe your data, you can update the shape of the curve and repeat the process. This is also known as the Continual Reassessment Method, or CRM. 3 plus 3 and CRM represent some simple designs for phase 1 trials. Now that we have a safe dose to give people, it's time to actually check if we normal is effective as a drug. But keep in mind that clinical trials take a long time. If you can't wait for this drug and you really need to start understanding statistics, then I think the sponsor of this video, Brilliant, can help you out. Brilliant is an online platform that has over 70 interactive courses in various fields, including math, computer science, and programming. One of the best parts of Brilliant is its focus on active learning. Instead of making you mindlessly read through text, Brilliant lets you take a hands-on approach with your learning with interactive exercises and quizzes. This way you build a more intuitive understanding of the material that will serve you better in the real world. Brilliant has both basic and advanced material to accommodate people who are at different points in their learning journey. For example, understanding probability is critical to truly understanding data and statistics. Brilliant offers several courses to get you up to speed, such as their Introduction to Probability and their Predicting with Probability course. From there, you can check your understanding through case studies and build models that let you do things like predict the next top song on Spotify. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash very normal or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription if you do so. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video, let's get back to our clinical trials. As I was saying before, we need to establish that we normal is actually effective at what it does. This is the role of phase 2 trials. What defines effective depends on what kind of medicine you're dealing with. With hypertension, you might want to see lower blood pressure. With cancer, you might define effective as tumor shrinkage. Since we normal deals with statistical ignorance, you might want to test if someone understands a p-value or not. What all of these outcomes have in common is that they're binary in nature so they're often modeled as Bernoulli random variables. Furthermore, these outcomes are usually easy to measure. Something like fatality or long-term survival would take too long for a phase 2 trial. To be effective is to have a high enough probability that will justify moving this drug to the last phase. For this reason, you tend to see one-sided hypothesis tests in phase 2 trials. This probability here typically represents a minimum probability to be useful as a therapy, and it's usually decided by doctors. In addition to efficacy, statisticians start to consider the safety of a drug in phase 2 trials. 
If a drug is causing too many side effects or is causing severe side effects, that's another aspect to consider before sending it to the next phase. Since phase two trials are focused on just effectiveness and not comparative effectiveness, many phase two trials only have one arm. There are comparative phase two trials, but I'm just gonna focus on some specific one-arm designs here. By clinical trial standards, phase two trials are still considered small, having a few dozen or a few hundred people. Phase two designs can be really simple. All you need to do is recruit some people, collect their data, and calculate a proportion. Kind of boring. This type of simple trial will work, but statisticians have invented new types of designs to make phase two trials more efficient in terms of time and resources. Pharma companies may have hundreds or thousands of drug candidates to test out. If a compound doesn't show promise, then it's in the company's best interest to move on as fast as possible. So some smart statisticians have developed two-stage designs to facilitate failing fast. The idea behind a two-stage design is to use the first stage as a sort of tryout period. The design is planned to go to the second stage only if an adequate number of successes are seen in the first stage. One example is Gehan's design, named after some guy named Gehan. This design only goes to the second stage if it sees at least one person respond to treatment. There's another popular design called Simon's design, named after some guy named Richard. In Simon's design, you only pass the first stage if some minimum number of people respond. Like with other trials, statisticians need to figure out the appropriate sample size to make sure that a trial has controlled power and type 1 error. In Simon's design, there's an extra wrinkle of needing to decide how many people need to respond in the first stage in order to move on to the second one. And this number influences both power and type 1 error. These stage 2 designs are a bit more complicated than the typical one stage design, but this added complexity allows statisticians to save people time and money while preserving important characteristics of an experiment. After We Normal has proved itself in phase 2 trials, it can move on to the final phase of the traditional model, phase 3. Phase 3 is the realm of comparative effectiveness, and it's where it'll need to prove that it's better than current medicines we have. Even if there isn't a current standard of care, we still need to compare the new drug against the placebo. It turns out that if you give people fake medicine and tell them that it's medicine, then you can expect some people to recover naturally without the help of any drugs. This is the infamous placebo effect, and it's something that statisticians need to account for to get the drug past the finish line. Most people who know about clinical trials are actually thinking about randomized controlled trials, or RCTs. RCTs are the quintessential trial for phase three, and for good reason. I've already covered RCTs in another video, but I'll give you a quick review. You randomize and blind people to either the treatment or placebo group and see what happens. And this randomization plays a crucial role in causal inference for RCTs. RCTs give us the best chance of concluding that a drug has a cause and effect relationship with treating disease. Some other popular designs in the phase three space are the crossover study and the factorial study. In a crossover study, the two treatment groups start in their initial group, but are then switched to the other group at some point in the trial. The idea here is that you can see both treatments work in each person, so each person can act as their own control. But now you have to account for possible carryover effects when you switch treatments. In factorial designs, you test different combinations of different treatments. One group may just get one active treatment, but others might actually get a combination of multiple treatments. This allows us to investigate possible interactions between drugs. But then we start running into multiple testing issues since there are multiple parameters of interest in the factorial design. Phase three trials are high stakes trials because they're what decide if new therapies can be used by the general public. Because of this, phase three trials usually involve hundreds or even thousands of people. Despite how prominent they are, the statistical methods behind phase three trials are relatively tame. At their heart, they're addressing a two sample problem because we're comparing two treatments. This means that standard statistical tools like the two sample t-test, linear regression, or Cox regression are used. This is definitely a huge generalization, but the key element of phase three trials is this comparative aspect. That being said, the beautiful thing about statistics is that different research areas may need totally different statistical methods, even if we just need to compare things. A method we use in oncology might be totally different than something we use in heart disease. So as a result, a statistician needs to be constantly learning. And that's a big reason why I like this field. Once our We Normal drug succeeds in an RCT, we can start to make moves to spread it to the general public. There are technically phase four trials, but these types of trials are concerned with more long-term outcomes for efficacy and safety. They ultimately look a lot like phase three trials, so I'm not gonna talk much about them. 
After all this, some of you might wonder, so what? What does knowing about clinical trials do for me today? Wouldn't it be better to get into AI like ChatGPT or Google Gemini? What is your best guess as to, as to what will be the first AI derived and discovered drug? Yeah. Well, we, we announced earlier on this year um, some big partnerships with Eli Lilly and, and Novartis. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're already working on, on real drug uh, programs. Uh, and I would be expecting maybe in the next couple of years, the first AI sort of designed drugs uh, in the clinic. Thanks to powerful models like AlphaFold 3, humans now have an unprecedented ability to create new therapeutic compounds that can potentially save millions of lives. But we can't just go around sticking mysterious AI-derived compounds in the people. To make sure that people stay safe in this exciting period for medicine, we'll need clinical trials and statisticians more than ever. And I hope that some of you are inspired to join in the process. If you like this video and want to see more statistics content, then consider subscribing to the channel. If you sign up for my newsletter, you can get my videos and some extra content delivered straight to your inbox when they go live. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.